My name is Justin, and I'm an addict. And thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts, I am sober one day at a time since June 19th, 2015. And for that, I am beyond grateful. I first want to express my hopes and wishes for a very healthy and happy 2021 to all. Welcome to the RICO 12 Speaker Meeting. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust and sex, food and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength and hope on a live Zoom meeting each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of the speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. In order to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are hearing this podcast recorded and would like to participate as a live audience member, or if you would like to be a guest speaker in a future meeting, please go to www.rico12.com, that's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com, to learn more and to submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations or to submit to become a guest speaker. RICO 12 is an ad-free service, and we appreciate your help in keeping it that way. We gratefully accept contributions to help cover the costs of the Zoom platform, podcast platform, web hosting, and administrative costs. To contribute, you can go to rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal that I will put in the chat of the live meeting and in the show notes. When you contribute, please specify the meeting number. This is meeting number 29. Um, last week's recorded recording was released on Christmas Day and was a bit unique for RICO 12. I read an essay called, I Am Already Dead. I am grateful for feedback I received from several of our listeners. It seemed to resonate with some as it did with me. If you missed hearing that one or any of the previous meetings we have done, you can listen to them in podcast form by searching for RICO 12 Speaker Meeting Podcast on virtually any podcast platform that you use. Or you can go to the RICO 12 website and find it under the link podcast. If you've also found value in this service, please take a moment to go to the podcast platform of your choosing and leave a rating and review. It helps us work our 12th step by carrying the message of recovery to more addicts who suffer. Now, one more word about our speakers before we introduce today's speaker. When we line up a speaker for a meeting, we ask them to seek guidance on what and how to present so that they can reflect the light that they have been given. That light will inspire hope, meaning, worth, and growth in each of us, the listening audience. Now, let's introduce our guest speaker for today. This is Tom B., and he'll be our speaker. His chosen topic is My Path to Meditation Practice, 20 Years of Struggle. Now, Tom B. is a member of AA with a sobriety date of May 20th, 1985. Uh, he has also been a member of Al-Anon since May of 1995. He is active in the program, working the steps with a sponsor and sponsoring others. He started a nonprofit called Transformations in Recovery to bring evidence-based curriculum to treatment centers and has been active on boards of conferences and treatment centers. His current passion is working with Father Bill W., who is a past guest speaker on RICO 12, to bring two-way prayer to people in recovery. Tom, the floor is yours. Take it away. Hey, well, thanks, Justin, and Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, my name's Tom B., and I'm a recovering alcoholic, a very grateful one at that. Um, uh, Justin and I did what I, I love to do, which is we exchanged sort of service commitments. Uh, he was helping me on my website, and I've, uh, I'm helping him here. And uh, that's the way uh, my program works, and I'm certainly grateful for all the service opportunities I've done. It keeps me uh, keeps me centered. And <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, although it wasn't, as you'll hear, it wasn't always my favorite topic, and that's meditation. And um, I'll give you a quick background of uh, what it was like for me when I was drinking, uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, what was going on for me kind of the path I took and then uh, what I've been doing since I really committed to uh, prayer and meditation in addition to my uh, my 12-step uh, work since about the mid-2000s. And then finally, maybe a couple of ideas about how that might transform into something you could try. So uh, jumping in, I was, uh, I was raised in a really small 
town in Oregon on the coast. Uh, my dad managed lumber mills. My mom was a school teacher, also an alcoholic. And I grew up in a very uh, abusive alcoholic home. And uh, I grew up very smart and very angry. And so if you put those two together, uh, usually good things don't happen. And for me, <clears throat> uh, uh, my life changed when I was about 12 and my parents were having a cocktail party and I finished somebody's drink. I think it was a Manhattan. And I decided that that was going to be my life's work right there, uh, that drinking uh, did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And uh, alcohol is very hard to get in this rural farm and I'm a smart kid. So before too long, I was, uh, I was making hard cider in my parents' basement. And before too long after that, I converted my mom's pressure cooker into a still, and I was uh, making Everclear and selling it to the high school students for, in exchange for beer. And my other passion when I was a small kid was uh, explosives. And like I said, very angry and uh, um, very driven. And so my favorite thing in the world to do was to get drunk and blow stuff up. And that continued through high school until one time I had a bunch of friends over and we, uh, the, an explosion I rigged uh, out of some nitroglycerin that I had made in my mom's freezer kind of uh, took on a new level of, uh, of uh, impact. And the FBI was called in and I decided to retire as a bomb maker. And uh, I must've been about 16 at the time. And in today's world, that wouldn't have ended well for me. And then people just didn't think anything of it. But I kind of went through uh, life in those early years, drinking and um, obsessively doing stuff that put my life in danger. So my favorite things uh, um, were like rock climbing, motorcycle racing, uh, offshore sailing, uh, you name it, if it had some adrenaline involved and I could drink while I was doing it, that's what I did. And um, went to some really great colleges, uh, ended up at Stanford for some graduate work and I was always gonna, didn't know what to do, but I, it was their electronics business was coming out about that time. And so I, um, noticed that most of the people in electronics were angry and smart and they're alcoholics. And I thought, wow, this is Silicon Valley is a place for me. So I started after Stanford, I started just drinking and doing these small companies uh, for startups and everybody was crazy like me and we would do uh, take mushrooms and go to Yosemite and rock climb on the weekends and stuff like that. We were, it was just, um, it was just insane. So I won't bore you with the details, but it got worse and worse until one day in 1985, um, I uh, was a research director at HP Labs. I had a few acres in the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley. I had a sports car, I was a successful marriage. And I decided the best thing I could do for myself was suicide. And I was going to drive my car off this road. And uh, for some reason, I didn't. And um, the next day, this guy called me. And he was also from my school, MIT. And he said, um, I hear you might want to sponsor. And I said, what's that? And that was my introduction to uh, AA. And I believe that moment was one of those things they talk about with, you know, divine intervention. So um, the next 10 years uh, of uh, me being sober was very interesting because it wasn't <clears throat> the way a lot of people uh, talk about it. It was uh, what I call my trading, trading addictions phase. So I stopped drinking, but uh, the next day I quit my wonderful job at HP Labs and took a crazy job at this obsessive startup, went to 100 hour weeks. I divorced my wife, um, who was a very nice person. And I don't know why I did that. And just started stirring up chaos in my life to, to uh, deal with the chaos I felt inside. And so that next 10, 10 years was like, I got sober, I continued to work the steps, I continued to get a little better, but um, 
the, my life around me just got to be raw chaos more and more. Uh, uh, alienated family, uh, uh, written up in my job performance. Uh, I did excellent work, but uh, it's just not appropriate to scream at employees, things like that. So uh, um, in the next stage, I kind of um, joined Al-Anon. I figured I needed to mellow out, learn how to <clears throat> deal with people. And I started into therapy. And that was my second day, uh, decade of sobriety. And um, things started getting better again. But I just upped the obsessive stuff to match. So skipping ahead to 2008, and that was sort of... Uh, I think my favorite year, because uh, one day early in 2008, I couldn't get out of bed. And I freaked my wife, my second wife then at the time out. And uh, long story short is I got myself into the Mayo Clinic. And after a week of tests, they said, we can't see what's wrong with you. And so they sent me over to the Alternative Medicine Center, which was a lot of PhDs, MDs from China and India. And they did another week of tests on me and they said, oh, you've got uh, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And I go, well, what's that? And they go, that's when somebody um, has a circuit breaker that breaks that tells them when they're doing too much. And what you've done is you've gone in and wired it open and kept going. So your body is shut down on you. And uh, do you know how to meditate? And I said, no, I hate meditation. I can't even get three or four breaths out before I'm thinking about movies or sports or sex or something. And I've tried it a thousand times and I can't do it. And uh, the head of the clinic turns to me and he says, uh, well, uh, that's the only thing we know that can help this. And if you don't learn to meditate, you'll be dead in five years. And I said, <laughs> I was going like, um, is there another option? Do you have a pill or anything? He goes, no, this is it. And I, in a moment of honesty, I said, I have no clue how to do that. And they had a program there and it was uh, by this company called Wild Divine. And now it's uh, called Unite and it's uh, in my uh, notes. And they clip an electrode to you and tell you when your brain waves calm down. And uh, I started doing regular lessons on that. And it took me three or four months of those lessons before I learned what meditation was supposed to feel like. Because I'm a dopamine kind of guy. That's what I know. That's what makes me feel good. And um, I didn't know anything else. So um, that was interesting. And so I started doing that and my life got better. And later on that year, a good friend of mine suggested that a few of us go to this retreat in Florida run by Sandy Beach. And those of you in AA or in uh, that do a lot of uh, listening to podcasts know Sandy is just, uh, he died a couple years ago, but he is uh, uh, just a phenomenal speaker and thinker. And uh, I would almost call him a mystic, at least in my mind, he was. And so I went down to this retreat in uh, it's called the Four Corners Retreat, and I did a four-day uh, workshop with him, and it's also in the notes. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the purpose of the of the workshop was to take people with decades of sobriety and introduce them to a spiritual path. And what Sandy's point was is at some point in all of our recoveries, it goes from a we program to an I program. In other words. You have to learn how to go inside and do the work once you've done the work that your fellows can help you with. And um, I found that just amazing because all of my work had done through my sponsor and through friends and through reading. And I really didn't do any deep introspective work. And one of the things Sandy did was he had this big table next to the uh, where we ate and on that table was like 20 books and they were all spiritual books. And he said, just pick one up and read a few sentences and see which one speaks to you. And um, I started doing that. And what I found out was they all spoke to me, every single one of them. And uh, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Christian, uh, 
the Muslim, I mean, everything had something to tell me. It was like, um, I couldn't believe I had been in the program for 20 years, stayed sober, uh, worked what I thought was a good program and was so naive and starved for any kind of connection outside myself. And I've also included uh, Sandy's uh, reading list from that, uh, that retreat in the, in the uh, cliff notes there. Um, so, uh, you know, the, those two experiences, one that was, um, I don't know, physiological at Mayo, which is from dopamine to serotonin, uh, one that was spiritual with Sandy Beach, going from an ego-centered life to a God-centered life. All of a sudden, those two concepts, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now as I even talk about it, merged together in me. And I realized that I was being sent a very strong message that this is what I needed to do to move my program along. And so I ordered every one of those books on Sandy Beach's uh, list. I uh, started... Uh, meditating and I started on a journey uh, that uh, lasted from 2008 to today of essentially what I call the kitchen sink approach to spirituality, which is I try everything. Um, I have tried more things than I can even talk about in, a, in an hour. And each process, each spiritual uh, connection I have, each way of meditating has helped me to understand more and more about my interconnection. And uh, it's just been a fantastic journey. So I'll, I'll just tell you about a few of them. Um, uh, my friend, Father Bill W., uh, uh, we started uh, working together at a, re at a treatment center. And when he retired, he invited me to go with him for a week at uh, St. George's College in Palestine to walk the ministries of Jesus. And I remember turning to him and say, well, Bill, I'm not even a Christian. I don't even know what I believe. And he says, oh, you should come along. This will be fun. He said, and I go, well, why don't you find another priest to go with you? And he said, no, they don't make me laugh like you do. So you're coming with me. And so him and I and seven Episcopal priests spent a couple of weeks wandering around Palestine, going to where Jesus was thought to be born, going where they thought he did the Sermon on the Mount, studying what he actually said and what he didn't say, what was myth and what was truth. And um, um, he talked me into doing the Eucharist every morning before we went on this um, process. And I found the, the sort of the ritual, the experience, the history, um, and, and learning to understand uh, this guy called Jesus, which I, my joke was I thought he would be a heck of a sponsor. Um, um, just phenomenal. And it just opened me up. I mean, here I was talking about uh, religious philosophy with a bunch of priests and talking about uh, my childhood and how it uh, closed me off to the church. And um, it was amazing. I had one guy that was a, was a, um, a priest for one of the units in Iraq, and he was there doing the thing. And he, he came to me after one of our evening sessions and he said, how do you share like that? And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, how do you share from within your heart rather than like reading from the Bible? And I said, well, you have to suffer a lot and, and almost kill yourself from drinking and then almost die. And then you come back and you figure this is the only option you've got. And he said, well, I need to learn to do that. I'm with people that die every day and they don't want to be preached to. They want someone to talk to. And I don't know how to do that. And I, I realized that uh, organized religion had some things to teach me, but a lot of things I needed to learn on my own. Uh, so the next one I went to was just the opposite. It was um, a, a friend did this thing called breath work and it was developed by a, uh, Jacqueline Small here in Austin. And it's essentially deep breathing uh, with loud drumming music. And it kind of puts you into a trance and you have visions. And then you do a drawing called a mandala of the vision. And then they help you interpret that vision from your subconscious. And I did a four day class on that in Wimberley, a little town not far from here. And it was fantastic. I had these visions of dying. I had these visions of helping others. I had all these visions. I had people helping me. 
And it was like this part of me that I didn't even know existed. Um, and then I started teaching uh, two-way prayer with Father Bill W. And that, his website's on the, on the notes as well. And that's a, another, what I call meditation slash prayer technique where you journal with God. And uh, Justin and I also do that. And um, that opened me up at another level. And um, then a couple years ago, I went to, uh, I always enjoyed lectures by Deepak Chopra. Uh, he's a Hindu doctor, MD, PhD in physics, kind of a, just a really interesting man. And I did a six day retreat at his retreat center where we did uh, Hindu meditation for about four hours a day, Ayurvedic diet, um, two hours of yoga a day. And I came away just loving that experience. So um, in the last 10 years, I've traveled all over the world and every place I go, I try to connect with the um, spiritual experience or the spiritual process in the area. I've gone into uh, mosques in Istanbul and asked them, asked the, uh, uh, one of the laymen to teach me how to pray like Muslims pray. I've gone into uh, uh, a, uh, Buddhist temple in, in Thailand and asked to, uh, for the monk to do a blessing with me and sat down and talked with the monks about their prayer practice and all that stuff. Um, I'm, probably one of the most interesting things I did is I found a healer when I was in Bali, uh, uh, even though it's cliched as heck, and sat down with him. He was 95, and he, uh, he did this um, acupressure-like thing on me and told me, um, where I was spiritually stuck. And it really helped me through some two-way prayer work and some other work, work through, you know, what was going on with me. So um, I guess what I'm saying is everything I have done has brought me closer to my spiritual center. There's not one thing I've tried. Some didn't work, some I moved away from, but uh, it's a big, wonderful world out there. And I think uh, it's, it just has helped me to uh, live a more productive life. Um, I'll talk for a minute or two about what my practice is now. Um, I have a, a place that um, in my attic that I call my sacred place. I have a, a little rug from uh, the, uh, one of the uh, Christian uh, charities in, in uh, Palestine that Bill and I went to that I use and I've got a little chair and I got a candle and um, I go up there and light those and then I do some spiritual reading. Uh, right now I'm reading uh, Meditations from Thomas Merton, who's one of my uh, just favorite mystics. And, um, and I usually read a book at the same time, a few pages. So right now I'm reading uh, uh, the Naked Now by Richard Rohr, uh, seeing how mystics see. And it's, I do that for, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. And then I will either do some two-way prayer and you can learn how to do that uh, either by listening to Bill's talk on this series or um, go to the website or I do a meditation. And sometimes I do meditations like the one I did this morning where I just set the timer and focus on my breath or one of the other many practices. And other times I use this uh, iPhone app called uh, Insight Timer. I've got a link to that on my notes. And the interesting thing about that is you can do a Christian centering prayer from Ireland by uh, Maria Giuliano, who's one of my favorite um, uh, people to lead uh, meditations. And the next day you can do uh, um, uh, Chief Cloudwalker, a Navajo Indian, talking about a mystic uh, journey to your center of your heart in the Navajo tradition. And I love them all. I mean, every single one opens me up and brings me closer to uh, uh, my spiritual center. And so I just, uh, I let, I try to let God direct me as to what I do that day and what needs attention. Um, so my experience is that, um, as I turn my energy in the program toward myself and toward this connection with my uh, higher power, or my spiritual center, um, my life gets better 
but also I think the magical thing is everything around me just works a lot better. Um, I am also codependent and the less time I spend managing other people's lives, the better my life goes. Um, so um, just a minute or two about some ideas for your journey. Um, I would encourage you if you're, if you're interested in this um, and <laughs> I, I feel kind of uh, uh, hypocritical suggesting to people how they pursue this path, given that it took the threat of death for me to pursue it. But um, I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I'd set aside a time every morning. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot, 10 or 15 minutes for a couple of months. And I would, uh, the most important thing I can tell you is I would be patient. Uh, it's called a practice for a reason. Uh, if you were learning to snow ski or if you were learning to uh, play tennis or any other mountain bike or whatever, it's not a uh, shoot a good jump shot. It's not unusual to spend years developing a practice that then you can lead on muscle memory. And uh, this is the same. Uh, it's taken me a long time, but you're worth it. I'm worth it. I'm so grateful that those experiences happened to me that uh, rub my face in the reality that I needed to change uh, or else I wouldn't be as happy as I am today. Um, and then my last bit of advice is to try everything and not let your prejudice against organized religion or your obsession with a particular point of view keep you from trying other points of view. It just, what I found is there's a connection across this world uh, that people have that is so strong that you can't help but connecting with it as you try these different spiritual practices. Um, and uh, so whatever your approach, um, I would say, you know, and, either from the, from the dopamine to the serotonin using the device that they had me do at Mayo Clinic, or from this ego-centered life to this God-centered life that I learned uh, with Sandy Beach and then later with all my work with Father Bill W. Um, it really doesn't matter how you start. It really doesn't matter as long as you have an intention to move in this direction. Uh, it's my belief that um, you will be directed how you need to be directed and you will find a path that makes your life a better place. So um, I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over back to Justin and uh, once again, wish everybody a happy new year. Thank you so much, Tom. I, I love the diversity of your experience in this, in this uh, walk of uh, conscious contact to put it in step 11 uh, terminology with God. Several questions have come in, but before we get to those questions, do you mind taking about 60 seconds uh, and share about the fellowship or fellowships that you belong to and how they help you? This isn't to market for them, but to allow others to understand how you know the fellowships you attend may be able to help them if they are walking a similar path. Sure. Um, I have always found that, uh, let's see, I've always found that I need um, a basis of structure in my life, even though I hate structure, to um, uh, continue my work so I don't backslip. So I have uh, my AA home group is the uh, Saturday Men's uh, Riverbend group uh, at 1030. And uh, we've been continuing that on Zoom, and I've been going to that meeting for 25 years. And um, that meeting is characterized by uh, the number of people in there that do service. There's about of the 30 people in there. I would say over half of us have started nonprofits or do that kind of work. And really, the, that's that's the foundation of my AA work. Um, I'm also uh, um, a member of the uh, Tuesday night men's fellowship in al -Anon. And I do that every Tuesday night at 7.30 at uh, um, uh, St. John's Episcopal Church. And I've been doing that for about 20 years. And that's a completely different focus. I work the steps in that program. I have a sponsor as well. Um, and um, I would say that um, the other couple of things just to mention in my structure is my two-way prayer practice with uh, with it. I started with Father Bill. I've done that, been doing that for about 10 years. And also I have a, 
a call list that I try to do. Um, right now I'm like at three calls a week where I try to make <clears throat> at least three calls a week to other people and just, just check things out. Um, a quick anecdote, uh, one of the questions in Sandy Beach's thing was someone said, um, how do you know if something's God is God's will? And he said, well, if you ask somebody, and he said, if you don't want to ask someone about that, it's probably not God's will. And I, that just struck me. So that's part of my program as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So we've got several questions that have come in. Um, and a reminder to anybody else who has questions, please type in any questions you have in the Q&A uh, link at the bottom of your Zoom window. Looks like two speech bubbles. We've got, we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, Father Bill asks, what has been your experience with people in 12-step focusing on meditation? It's in the 11th step, but do you see the men you work with practicing it? I think it's... Um... <clears throat> It's a hard question to generalize on. Um, I had a friend that once uh, always started out his talk by, by saying he, he drank to feel better, he stopped drinking to feel better, and he went to meetings to feel better, and when everything else failed, he worked the steps to feel better. Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a small group of people that really jump into a spiritual practice and then just do it. It's like working out or a diet plan or anything else. Uh, the guys I sponsor, uh, the guys that do uh, regular meditation and prayer in some form, um, spend more of their time working through their own life's issues and less of their time worrying about other people. And I think uh, so it tends to uh, help you really focus your energies of your recovery, I would say. Thank you. All right. We had a question come in from Thomas. Thomas says, Tom B, thank you so much for your guidance on the path of meditation. Regarding meditation, what do you say is more important? Quantity measured in minutes or hours or quality measured by connection with my higher power? Um, you know, uh, I led a meditation workshop about uh, five years ago with this conference I go to every year called the Man to Man Conference, which is a Al Anon. And uh, I did 15 minutes a day, and the guy that was co-leading the, uh, the uh, uh, seminar with me was a, uh, a meditation uh, uh, guy at, at, for Transcendental Meditation, and he did three and a half hours a day. And so we talked about that, and I, I think everyone is different. I find that there are a lot of people that can't even put 10 breaths together because their mind is just, and I was one of those people. Right now, what works for me is about 15 minutes a day, you know, five minutes of reading. And, and sometimes I even put a little stretching before that to calm me down a little bit. But I think you have, that's a personal choice that you have to find about um, what I think connection is, is the best thing. And, and so I would start out, guess at a time, do it for a couple of months, and then just as necessary. Thank you. Um, question that I have for you, and this might throw a little wrench in this flow that we've got going here, but we'll bring it back to the flow after this wrench. Early on in your story, you talked about the chaos um, of the first you know, while of your, of your sobriety, of working the steps, attending meetings, yeah. and all those things. Why do you think that some people find so much chaos in the first years of sobriety? And, and is there an antidote? Is the antidote connection with God or is there another antidote for that? Well, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I'll tell you a, a metaphor that uh, um, one person told me that uh, uh, <laughs> I tend to like. He said, um, imagine your life is a pressure cooker. And um, in that pressure cooker is all your experiences of your life. And if you're an alcoholic or another addict, that pressure cooker is mostly full of shit, okay? And he said, the good news is when you get into recovery, um, the pressure cooker relief valve is released and, and all that pressure goes away. He said, the bad news is the shit comes out first. And um, I always love that analogy because I, uh, I remember, you know, you can just remember 
people that knew me said, I wish you'd go back to drinking. I mean, it was, uh, it was not what I thought it was going to be. But I think that's a necessary part of recovery. And I think that's why God gives us the pink cloud. And, and uh, I think those first few years, uh, thank goodness I didn't know more. You know, because those are those are times you just have to do your best. I call it my survival period. And I think that's that's what you try to teach young sponsees is you just need to survive this part, establish a new way of life and then start growing. So I, I think a lot of it is people are, are naive, naive about for most of them on on what that early sobriety really looks like. No, then, thank you. Uh, just one, I'm sorry. One other thing I would say is the more you can get into service early, um, I found the less painful it is. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. And I appreciate that uh, perspective on that. Uh, a couple other questions here. Let's see. Could you explain in some detail what happens during a meditation time for you? Uh, <laughs> not really, but, um, uh, let me let me uh, uh, do a quick sidebar here. Um, so Richard Rohr's definition of a mystic is someone that sees with their whole being. And I remember one of his analogies is, let's say you look at a sunset. And um, uh, the first way to look at a sunset is you say, wow, that's beautiful. Look at the yellows and the, and the reds. And the next level to see a sunset is if you understand uh, the spectrum and how the edge of the atmosphere refracts the light and what some of the understanding behind the sunset is. You can understand how it feels, but you can also understand what's underneath it. And then the third way, and it's called uh, seeing through the third eye or what the mystics see or what meditation is about is you see with your whole being. You're not thinking about something. You're not feeling something. You experience it with your whole body. So uh, it took me using that Unite um, uh, electrode on my ear three months to, to answer my own answer to that, your, your question. I didn't know what it even felt like, but um, if you try some of these things, and that's why I'm a big fan early on of guided meditations, especially the uh, Native American Indian guided meditations, Try one of those and see if they can pull you into that experience. And you kind of have this experience of losing yourself, losing your ego, losing your sense of time and place. And that is, uh, uh, gives an opening to bring the spiritual part in. So that's, that's as close as I can, I can get to a very open question. Oh, great. Thank you. You mentioned uh, you losing your ego. Now in, in meditation, do you ever meet up face to face with your ego? And what does that look like? Well, I do that a lot in two way prayer in my writing. Um, in fact, uh, <laughs> we, I uh, was joking with my wife the other day um, that I've got these two little I won't, I won't say what I call them, but I've got these two little angels on my shoulder and one's telling me, you know, uh, you're a dumbass, you know, go for this, just do it, just steamroll this person. The other one's saying, you know, <laughs> what would Jesus do? And, um, you know, so I think uh, alcoholics especially and, and my friends that have other addictions, uh, I found that to be similar, but I can speak from my own experience is, that happens to me all the time, um, not so much in meditation, but in two-way prayer and also in my step work. Um, and as long as you got that going on, the more of that you can resolve, the more open you'll come into meditation. Thank you. Um, what, I mean, with all of these different backgrounds of, of, of your conscious contact with your spiritual core, I think is what you called it. Um, what, what, or who is God to you? What does, what is your understanding, or as I've heard said, your misunderstanding of your higher power look like today? Gee whiz. Um, well, again, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
you know, as Jesus said, and a lot of other mystics have said to, uh, if you understand God, you, it's not God, right? It's, uh, so my sense is there is this, um, let's see. First of all, I'd like to say that I haven't found this answer to be particularly helpful as I've read it from other people. Okay, so I'll answer your question because you ask it, but I haven't found it to be particularly helpful because like when Bill and I do work in two-way prayer and one person says, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in an inner, quiet inner voice and they do their work. And this other person says, I believe in the Jesus as defined by the Episcopal Church before they split, uh, blah, 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 and they do their work, I haven't really seen a qualitative difference between their spiritual experience. So I think that's sort of an intellectualization that people do to comfort themselves. Um, but again, <laughs> to straight up and try to answer your question, it's sort of a spirit that lives within me and outside of me that kind of... Uh, surrounds me that I feel closer to when I'm in nature that uh, I can access whenever I'm not stuck in my ego that gives me guidance and it's always uh, the parent that I wanted to have. I love that. And, and, and I'm going to interject something here because my understanding or misunderstanding of that God uh, that guides me through this has um, evolved and changed quite a bit. My whole life, I've been a very dogmatic, you know, God is in this box and anything outside of this box just can't be God. Right. And as I speak with people from all sorts of different backgrounds, like yourself and many others who I've spoken to both here in this and in other settings, um, I found that, uh, that God's voice can be heard by anyone at any time in any way, if they're willing to listen and whatever that means to them is is an amazing thing to me and to them. Really cool stuff. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. All right. Uh, another question that came in, and, and we've got a few more minutes. If anybody else in the listening audience has a question for Tom, please type it in the Q&A link there at the bottom, or you can even do it in the chat if you wish. But uh, we've got another question here for you, Tom. What is the difference between prayer and meditation? Um, I saw that one come up and I was kind of dreading that one. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's the standard textbook answer, which is prayer is talking and meditation is listening. But I think that's overly simplistic. Uh, for instance, in my two way prayer practice, um, almost all of that is listening. And yet we call it prayer. Um, in my meditation practice, all of it is listening, but the big challenge is to stop talking because my, my ego always wants to interchange in there. I would say that uh, depending on your practice and your focus, uh, the two can almost be used interchangeably, but prayer traditionally means uh, you read something or you ask for something or you ask a blessing or you bless others or whatever. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing I was reading in Roar's book was that uh, uh, Jesus only did one prayer and that was the Lord's prayer. And the thinking behind that by some of the scholars I've read is that your prayer should be between you and your higher power. They should not be written down or be given to someone else. Uh, Two-way prayer is the same thing. Why read a, a sayings book or a prayer book or a meditation book when you have your own connection with your spiritual center? So once you say that it's an internal process and you are asking and listening, then the two kind of merge. But I, I think going back to, uh, you know, uh, asking is more prayer and meditation is more listening, um, that's a good kind of place to start. But I, again, uh, sorry to keep saying this, but I have found the distinction uh, for me not to be particularly useful. I really appreciate it. And I, I love the, 
the step-by-step process that we all go through in life. Um, and I think that's the same as what you're sharing here. Hey, you know, this is a very useful way to step to begin this process of meditation is to think of it this way, but keep your mind open. And I think that's one of the main things of your message here. Open up and and look and listen and and do those things. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, do you have any final words of wisdom before we go into well, the wrap up here? Let's see. Um, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, the, the main thing for me is that, um, you know, if you go back and look at the 11th step and um, the work that um, Bill and I have done in two-way prayer is that because of the trends in our society of fewer people going to church, fewer kids having parents that went to church, uh, fewer um, that people don't have any kind of a religious um, tradition or experience to go back to, maybe 30% do, that um, if you don't have any kind of a spiritual tradition in your life, it might be useful to sort of look and read and, and try to understand what you're losing. Because um, I was, uh, you know, I was 50 before I got slammed in the head and started this practice. And you don't have to wait as long as I did. The, the information's all out there. And I, I don't think there's any question that life is richer if you have some kind of spiritual practice, even if it starts with yoga and then you move on from there. You know, anyone that's ever gone to a yoga class knows that um, when you do that sort of part at the end where you sit there and you do your breathing and whatever, there's something in that practice that um, centers you. And the information's all out there. uh, And I would just really encourage people to give it a try. Awesome. Thanks again, Tom. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. And in this case, about meditation and and conscious contact with God. I think that this was a very good way to start us off in 2021. If we didn't get to your questions, or if you have any other questions, please go to rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and ask those questions and answer others' questions that will come up. I I invite the audience to come back next week. If you have not yet gone to rico12.com and submitted your email address to get on the invitation list so that you can join us live each Friday at noon central time, I invite you to do so. Now, before we close this meeting with a prayer that uh, that Tom has picked out here, the Merton prayer, uh, there are many here um, live and many more who will be listening who are likely setting New Year's re- resolutions for the year 2021. Whether your goals may include getting sober and staying sober, or improving my conscious contact with God, or surrendering my relationship with food, or seeking guidance, reflecting light, and inspiring hope, meaning, and worth, and growth to those around you, or whatever it may include, my experience is that putting God, as I understand God or misunderstand God, first in my day, every day, one day at a time, for the rest of my life until I'm safely dead, is a great way to move forward to meet those resolutions. Now, Tom is asked to close this meeting with the Merton prayer to send us out into our day. Uh, please join him in this as he says that. Thanks again, Justin. And just a quick note on Thomas Merton. Um, one of my favorite authors, a mystic, and a man after my own heart, because after a very destructive first half of his life, he decided he wanted to be a priest, and he went to the Franciscan monastery and told them his intentions, and they turned him away because they said he was too messed up for their order. And he went on to um, do some of the most fantastic writing, I think, of the last century. So this is uh, the Thomas Merton prayer. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have the desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know anything about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, 
I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Keep coming back, everybody. It works if I work if I work it. So work it. You are worth it. Thanks again, Tom. Everybody have a great day and happy new year. See